Okay. Uh, let's see. Volume check. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I hope uh, I hope you all had a great spring break and are ready to get back into it. Um, homework four. I'm sure some of you were looking for it. Um, so there was uh, there were some difficulties on our end getting it out, and we do apologize for that. Um, it'll be out today, and then the due date will be pushed back a little bit. And it's also we've also made it a little bit shorter to sort of uh, account for uh, a little bit of time that you lost. We generally weren't considering spring break as uh, part of the time that you <laughs> would necessarily spend on homework, but you know, nevertheless, it's probably better to uh, to make it a little bit shorter and then push back the due date by a little bit. So that's what we're going to do. So look for it later today, and look for you know all other relevant announcements on Piazza later today as well. Okay, let's get started. What's today's about? What's today's lecture about? Well, actually, this whole week's lecture will uh, see a little bit of a switch in focus um, from supervised learning, which is basically everything that we've done so far, or everything that we've done so far is supervised learning. This week, we're going to be talking about unsupervised learning instead. And I think that probably the easiest way that we can sort of characterize unsupervised learning is just a little bit of change to sort of the assumptions about what we're given. So we've always assumed sort of having access to this data that comes in the form of like input, output pairs, right, xi, yi, n of those. Um, and the goal was very well defined. It was build a model that's able to predict y from x, right? Um, and then that goal was then to build that model and then have that model be able to generalize uh, to new xy pairs that we see or new x's, and then make the right prediction for those x's. So then the question that we're going to be looking into this whole week, uh, sort of a sneak peek, right? Because this is actually a very large area. We're going to see a couple of things, but not the whole picture. Uh, the question is, what would we do, or what could we do, uh, if we only had x's? So we no longer have these nice input-output pairs from which we can build a predictive model. Now we only have sort of maybe some unlabeled examples that we have lying around. What can we do with those? You might first be asking, why do we even care? Well, part of the reason why we care is that a lot of the times in the real world, it's a whole lot easier to get unlabeled data than it is to get labeled data. Okay, a lot of the times for labeled data, it's very expensive. Uh, you need humans to come in and give you labels, give you, you know, these like gold standard predictions that your model should be making. These things become very expensive very quickly and they don't really scale super well all the time if you want like a massive amount of data. On the contrary, it's actually very, very easy to collect unlabeled data. Uh, it exists in massive quantities on the internet, and you can go download as much of it as you want, uh, and then maybe you can still do something that's kind of useful with that data. Uh, part of this is uh, sort of what's really powering at least the last five years of deep learning, uh, is being able to make really, really good use of this unlabeled data to still learn something useful. What is that something useful? Well, it's a little harder to, defi to define, right? So when we had supervised learning, the objective was really clearly defined. It was be able to predict y from x. That's the whole thing, right? That's all it is that you're trying to do. All you want is a model that's an accurate model of y given x. Well, if we only have x's, we can't really say that that's our goal anymore. It doesn't really make sense, right? So we have to come up with new and different goals uh, for what it is that we're even trying to do with the data that we're given in the first place. Okay, so if we're only given x's, what, it is that we're, what, it is that, what, it, what is it that we're even trying to do? Um, well, one general way or one rough way that we can sort of characterize a lot of unsupervised learning is that if we're given x's, maybe we can still do something in terms of learning about the structure of the data. Uh, so what problem are we working with and what can we sort of infer about that problem uh, and then be able to analyze that problem in order to gain new insights. So that's a very, very high level description of what it is that we're trying to do. We're going to see two particular examples of what that analysis, uh, you know, structure discovery and things like that, what that can look like uh, in certain, you know, more narrow applications. Um, in particular, today and Wednesday, we're going to be talking about the idea of dimensionality reduction. So if I have X's that are given to me and there's some very high dimension, you know, like something like images, right, 
where I could have like hundreds of thousands of pixels or something like that, can I somehow meaningfully reduce the dimensionality of all of those Xs, reduce the dimensionality of my data to make it easier to work with, easier to understand, while still retaining most of the information that I have uh, in my data, for example, in my images. And then on Friday, we'll go a slightly different route and talk about an idea called clustering, which you may have seen before, which is basically, can I understand my data as coming from distinct groups? What are those groups? How do I find them? And then what does that tell me about the data? So we're gonna be doing these things this week. Uh, those are kind of the high level goals. So we're doing dimensionality reduction today. And I kind, of I kind of wanted to relate it a little bit uh, to this you know, general idea of featureization, which we've already talked about, but sort of in the other direction, if that kind of makes sense. So remember, we've asked this question since lecture one, right? because I think that you know, out of all the questions that we could be asking, this question is increasingly important in machine learning, which is what is x? Right? So if I want to build a model that predicts y from x, as in supervised learning, uh, well, maybe I have some x that's just sort of given to me uh, in some form, but is that the best x that I could be using? Is there some other representation of x? Uh, what is it that I want to actually be using in my model to predict y from x? Well, one way that we actually looked at this question right earlier was through the lens of kernelization, or sort of just you know feature expansion in general, right? Where essentially what we were doing was sort of lifting our data into something that was higher dimensional. Right? And why were we doing this? Well, if we lifted it into something that was like polynomial, for example, then we could have linear models, like all the models that we've studied so far, uh, being effective even for data that's not necessarily uh, obeying some kind of linear relationship. Right? Uh, so if I wanted more complex decision boundaries or something like this, uh, then something like kernelization could be really useful and really powerful when combined with these simple models, like these linear models. So that was one lens that we took. Uh, was trying to understand why might we want higher dimensional feature representation. What we're doing today is going in the other direction and asking why might we want lower dimensional feature representations, right? So it's not always gonna be the case that we need something that's higher dimensional than the data that we're given. Sometimes we're already given really high dimensional data, right? Like hundreds of thousands of pixels in a, in a single image, right? So sometimes what we wanna do is go from high dimensional data, which is what we're given, into something that's lower dimensional, easier to work with, easier to understand, but still retains most of the information that I need in order to solve my particular problem. And this is what's known as dimensionality reduction, okay? And as funny as it seems, these, these two different ideas of you know, sort of higher dimensional feature representations and lower dimensional feature representation, they're actually not mutually exclusive, okay? So sometimes what we wanna do to process our data is actually do a little bit of both. So maybe first do uh, kernelization, lift it into a higher dimensional space, and then dimensionality reduce from there, uh, or vice versa, do some kind of dimensionality reduction, try to understand the most important dimensions of my original data, and then featureize on top of that so that my linear models are gonna work really well. Okay, these are all different options that we can take. It's good to know about all of these different techniques uh, in order to sort of get the full arsenal of what we can do given some particular data representation. So let's start with a relatively simple picture. Imagine that I have this data set, okay? This is something called a Swiss roll. Hopefully everybody can uh, sort of understand what it is that we're looking at here. Um, you can ignore the colors if you want. The colors are just there to try to help you visualize a little bit better. Can anyone tell me what dimensionality is this data? Okay, so I hear three. This, da this data is three-dimensional. I certainly see three axes on this plot, right? X, Y, and Z. Uh, if I gave you this data set, it's very plausible that I could give it to you as you know, a set of X, Y, Zs, right? X is not like the X that I was talking about before, the data point, right? X is now like this one axis that I'm talking about. Anyway, so I, I could give you each one of these data points as a three-dimensional point, right? Any other suggestions? Yes. Four. Oh, oh, so ignore the color. Yeah, ignore the color. That's only there to help you visualize. If the color was important, then that would be a good answer. Yeah. 
Yeah, interesting, right? So one of the things that I like to think about is like, imagine you took a piece of paper, which technically is three-dimensional, but forget that really small, you know, height dimension, and then you sort of rolled it up into this shape, right? Um, so that's like a three-dimensional thing, but I could sort of unroll it into essentially a two-dimensional plane uh, that keeps essentially all of the same information that I had before, right? So in particular, for this data set, we've plotted it as three-dimensional, maybe sort of originally, you can think of it as three-dimensional points. However, maybe we can do something that uh, you know, reduces that dimensionality, but pretty much all the information is still retained. Uh, and in this particular you know, sort of toy example, right, what we can actually do is this sort of unrolling procedure that I described before in order to get a two-dimensional representation that you know, essentially has all the same information that we had earlier. Um, maybe there's a little bit of noise sort of in the point, so it's not exactly perfectly aligned on this two-dimensional plane, but it's pretty much there. Uh, like the noise is kind of negligible, you retain pretty much all the information that you cared about. However, one thing that's pretty important to note is that we're not just doing feature selection here, right? So remember we had like one or two slides earlier in the, in the class where we talked about feature selection, which was if I gave you, you know, three dimensions, can I select like two of those dimensions that keep most of my information or something like that? That's actually not what we're doing here, right? So it's not the case that I just pick like X and Y or X and Z or Y and Z and I got my two dimensional representation, I actually had to do a little bit more work than that, right? I had to somehow transform my original representation into a different feature representation that I could have in two dimensions, right? Um, so that's the basic idea behind dimensionality reduction is that sometimes we might be able to find a new, dimension, uh, find a new representation of our data that's lower dimensional, but it's not always gonna be as simple as just picking and choosing the feature dimensions from the original representation. Okay, so a little bit more formally now. For certain applications, in fact, we hypothesize for many applications, for most applications, uh, the data may naturally come in one representation. For example, pixels in an image, think about that, okay? But there may be other representations of the data that are lower dimensional, okay? So this one's a little bit harder to think about, uh, but do try your best to think about, you know, what is the space of possible natural images that I could have, like images that I could plausibly take on a camera in the real world, okay? So it's going to be much smaller than the space of possible pixels in an image, right? Because if I individually vary all these different pixels in an image, most of the time what I'm gonna get is like noise, something that doesn't make any you know, sense in the natural world. Uh, so even though I have this very, very high dimensional pixel space, that's sort of my original data representation, maybe I could have a much lower representation of the possible different natural images uh, that's somehow easier to work with because it's lower dimensional. Okay, this is an example of what some people refer to as the manifold hypothesis, which is the basic idea that all of your high dimensional data actually lives in a much lower dimensional manifold uh, in that high dimensional space. So we don't have to think about this very concretely. You know, you can sort of, you know, as a you know, toy example, think about like, you know, hyperplanes uh, in larger dimensional spaces. It's kind of the same idea, but we're not gonna talk about it in a whole lot of detail. We're gonna call the original data dimensionality the ambient dimensionality, okay? So that's the dimensionality uh, that the data comes in. And then this possible lower dimensionality that we can represent our data in, we're gonna call it the intrinsic dimensionality of our data. More specifically, the intrinsic dimensionality actually refers to the lowest possible dimensionality that can represent my data. But oftentimes, we're talking about like approximately representing the data and stuff like that anyway, so we're not gonna worry too much uh, about these uh, you know, particular technical definitions, it is good to know that sometimes people talk about dimensionalities in this way, although at the same time, none of these terms are sort of universal. Uh, sometimes people use other terms for, uh, for, these, for these concepts as well. So as an example that I'll show you at the very end of class, uh, after we've learned some of the technical bits, if we have time, uh, we can consider sort of these 32 by 32 gray grayscale images of faces. Okay, this is a very, very simple, very, very small image. Okay, it's only 32 by 32 images, or sorry, pixels. Um, and there's only one channel because there's no color information, right? But even just these tiny, tiny images of faces uh, already gives us a thou over a thousand dimensions, right, in pixel space. So the ambient dimensionality here is 1,024, okay? Uh, I don't know if this is very clear to anybody, but 
here are all the different you know, faces in this data set. Something that we're going to think about uh, you know, along with this example sort of at the end of class is, is the intrinsic dimensionality of this data set perhaps lower? The answer is almost certainly yes. Uh, because you know, in my original 1,024 dimensional space, it's not the case that I can sort of just change pixels independently from each other, right? Like I can't like you know, change a pixel and then change the neighboring pixel in a completely different direction and then do this like you know, sort of mixing because I'm not going to get faces anymore, right? I'm going to get something that looks a lot more like noise, uh, and those are not you know, sort of valid images of people's faces. So we might imagine that there are much fewer dimensions that I can sort of represent uh, this data in. And they might you know, even intuitively correspond to things like you know, which way is the person facing, you know, are they wearing sunglasses, or you know, how big is their nose, and all this other kind of stuff uh, that is a lot more interpretable in terms of actually understanding the data uh, in a more reasonable way. Right? So ambient dimensionality 1024. Might the intrinsic dimensionality be lower? Probably. And it would be pretty cool if we can sort of figure out at least approximately what that intrinsic, when that, what that intrinsic dimensionality might be. Okay, so that's kind of the goal of what we're doing today, and we'll come back to this, to this example later on. But it is perhaps useful to try and talk a little bit first about why we care. Okay, so what is, you know, it's good to think about these things concretely, right? But what is actually useful about getting closer to the intrinsic dimensionality of the data? Why is it not the case that, you know, I can just use the, ambient, use the ambient dimensionality directly or you know, use the original data representation directly. What might I, how might I benefit uh, by learning some kind of lower dimensional representation of my data? Any suggestions? Yes. Visualization, absolutely. This is something that I put. So uh, I put one thing first, and this is not in any particular order. We may wish to better understand the problem, like if we can deduce that you know, our data set only has a certain number of degrees of freedom rather than the original data representation that's useful. And we may wish to make it easier to sort of visualize the data, right? So if I can reduce the dimensionality down to two dimensions, right, uh, then oftentimes that's kind of what I need in order to be able to actually like make plots and things like this, or you know, scatter the data onto a scatter plot, something like that. Any other suggestions? Perfect. So we may wish to speed up supervised learning. So remember I said you know, we don't have Ys. Uh, but you know, even if we did have Ys, we could just take all the Xs and try to do some kind of dimensionality reduction. right? Or maybe we get the Ys later for some other smaller data set, something like that. right? So we may wish to speed up supervised learning, since the runtime of a lot of the methods that we've studied so far actually depend on the data dimensionality. Right? Think about all these linear classifiers and regressors. Uh, you know, we're learning theta, and what is the dimensionality of theta? It's the same as your feature dimensionality, right? So if you reduce your feature dimensionality, then your theta gets smaller. All the subsequent comp computations and you know training and all of that other stuff also gets faster as a result. Okay, so that's good. The last one that I listed here is something like, well, maybe we want to get rid of noise in the data. So actually, in the Swiss roll example that we had before, uh, you know, it almost perfectly lied on that uh, you know two-dimensional manifold. However, there was some noise added to all the data points, so it doesn't perfectly lie on there. Uh, we might actually want to discard that noise if we think that that's just something like you know sensor errors, like measurement errors and things like this, right? If we don't think that that's actually a valid part of the problem, maybe getting rid of it is actually just better. And maybe sometimes dimensionality reduction can help us separate the signal from the noise and then get rid of the noise part and only keep around the stuff that's more important than that. Okay, so those are the basic ideas. Yes. Uh, right, so the noise in the Swiss roll example was actually, I think, like a little bit of added noise in the z direction, uh, so up and down. Uh, but you know, that was just uh, you know the particular way that that toy example was instantiated. Okay, so we have an ambient dimensionality. We want to get that down into something closer to the intrinsic dimensionality of the data. We might not be able to do this perfectly, right? We don't always have all the tools uh, to do, you know, very complex data analyses. But we have some pretty good tools uh, for getting closer to the intrinsic dimensionality, and we're going to start with perhaps the most canonical one, which is PCA, Principal Component Anal Analysis. 
I already said this. Let's first start by studying the most canonical approach to dimensionality reduction, which is called principal component analysis, PCA. This is a principal, by the way, P-A-L. That is not a typo. The idea behind PCA uh, is, well, first, actually, we're going to start off linear, OK? Because starting off linear just simplifies our lives a lot of the times. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, I have my original data. It's d-dimensional. I want to change my data into something that's k-dimensional, OK, where k is smaller than d, OK? And there might be a whole lot of ways that I can go from something d-dimensional to something k-dimensional, but why don't we just start by restricting ourselves to something that's linear, OK? So we're basically going to build like a d by k matrix such that if I multiply my d-dimensional data by that matrix, out comes something k-dimensional. Okay, that's going to be the basic idea behind what we're doing here in PCA. So if x is our design matrix, remember design matrices, n data points, d features, right? So every row is a data point. What we wish to do is construct a d by k matrix, like I said before, where k is something smaller than d, oftentimes much smaller than d, such that we can right multiply this matrix with x, right? So x times this matrix, matrix multiplication, in order to get a k-dimensional data representation. So out comes something that's n data points by k features, OK? And if k is smaller than d, then we have successfully done dimensionality reduction, which is our goal. So in this case, in the case of PCA, we're doing linear projections of our data, right? So we're trying to figure out uh, is there some linear way that I can uh, you know, go from D dimensions, D features, into K dimensions, okay? And a very natural question to ask then is, well, what is the best possible linear proje projection that I could have? I've put best here in quotes because there probably are a lot of different ways that we can sort of define best. Actually, on Wednesday, we'll see a slightly different one. Um, but PCA you know, takes a, you know, a, you know, a pretty intuitive uh, approach to trying to define what the best possible linear projection is, and that's sort of the focus of what we're going to do uh, for the next couple of slides. OK, but does everybody understand sort of what we're trying to accomplish here? We're trying to learn a linear pro projection from the original D features into something that's smaller, the K features that we're going to have after this. OK, that's the goal. OK, good, then let's jump into it. Let me draw some intuition. Hopefully, all of this will be a little bit more clear. Imagine I had two-dimensional data, OK? I probably wouldn't be doing dimensionality reduction on two-dimensional data to begin with, uh, but it's just so much easier to draw things. So let's pretend I'm trying to do dimensionality reduction on two-dimensional data to get one-dimensional data, OK? That's the idea that we have here, OK? And here are all my data points. All these little blue dots are my two-dimensional data, OK? So we can naturally ask, well, what is the best quote unquote axis that I can project onto? Why did I put axis in quotes? Well, it's pretty easy to interpret axis as like x axis, y axis, right? But like I'm not limiting my uh, you know, possible choices to just these canonical axes, this basis that we have currently, right? I could have axes that are like all these different vectors uh, that maybe I can find a better vector that's not axis aligned that I can project down to, uh, and then that's going to give me maybe a data representation that I like better uh, than just having these axis aligned uh, things, right? Um, if I was only considering axis aligned possible ways to project my data, what am I doing? I'm doing feature selection, right? That's what it is that we talked about, you know, very briefly before. Uh, but that would be like just picking x1 or just picking x2, right? We're not doing that. We're actually trying to learn linear projections of our data down into some one-dimensional subspace uh, that we have to somehow define like what is the best in terms of uh, you know the quantity that we're actually trying to optimize. Let me give you a picture that hopefully will give some intuition as to what we can think about as projections that are better versus projections that are maybe not so good. So I'm going to visualize this from the center of the data, which is you know, some, somewhere roughly here. And let's say that I picked this axis 
to project along. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that basically, you know, take this line, I'll extend it out this way as well so we can sort of visualize it, and project all of the data onto that hyperplane, onto that line uh, in this two-dimensional space, right? And then maybe, you know, you can like center that back into the, where you pick the blue point as the origin and then sort of do some axis alignment, but basically all the data is going to live on that line, okay? So we can do this kind of projection and we can get one, one representation of our data uh, very, very cartoonishly, we can imagine that, you know, let me draw that better. If this is like the line that we're projecting down onto, right, then maybe our data after projection kind of looks like, you know, something like this. Not drawn accurately. I mean, I have like, you know, a hundred data points, so I'm not going to draw all of them. But let's say, you know, it looks something like that. Or, here's another possible axis that I could project onto. This one over here. So I'd be projecting, essentially, my data points, right? I'd be projecting them down onto this axis, right? Can you see this laser pointer? This data, this data point projects down onto this axis, okay? What might the data look like in that case? Well, if I project it down into that, in that way, my data will probably look a whole lot more bunched up, right? Probably look something like that, where I get sort of all the data in sort of this like tiny little region of uh, you know this this axis that I projected down to. Which one of these seems better as a reduced representation of our data? Intuitively. The green one. I picked these colors very carefully, right? Can anyone sort of give some intuition as to why the green one might be better than the red one? Great, so the data is more spread out, there's more variance along this particular direction, right? Why might that be good to have more variance? Perfect. So probably eventually we'll want to do, right, even, it, maybe it's for supervised learning, maybe it's just for data understanding, is to differentiate between data, different data points, right? Uh, we want to sort of, in a sense, maintain the information that we have about the data and sort of maximizing this variance, maximizing the spread of our data is the way that we sort of maintain information about the different data points, how we differentiate them from each other, right? And if we collapse it onto a particular dimension uh, where all the data points kind of look like each other, then in some sense we've lost a lot of information about our data, right? We no longer have uh, sort of as much information as we could have uh, in order to try to do other things like prediction uh, or you know data understanding or different things like this. Okay, so that's the high-level idea. So let me write out a sentence. More information is retained. by maximizing the variance, okay, of the projected data. And this is what PCA basically defines as best, or better versus worse, right? The more variance we retain in the projected data, the better that dimensionality reduction is through the lens of PCA. Let me add a note because it's not pictured here, but it is important. When we do PCA, we actually center the data first. Why do we center the data first? Uh, well, what does it mean? What well, means that you know all the different feature dimensions, the original feature dimensions, are going to have mean zero, right? If I basically take this blob of data and then move it to the origin, right? And why are we going to do that? We're going to do that because it 
simplifies all of our computations significantly, right? If I don't have to worry about the mean of x, right? If the mean of x is zero, that just makes things way simpler when I'm thinking about things like variances, right? Because then variances just become like a single term squared rather than something minus the mean squared, right? I don't want to have to worry about all these means, so I'm just going to say there's mean zero. Okay, it's fine. It's this data pre-processing that I've done. Just center the data. So that's the intuition behind PCA. We want to try to find these projections uh, that after I project my data down onto this axis, I retain the most variance possible uh, in that reduced data dimensionality. Okay? So let's actually think a little bit about the math behind how we're going to do this. So let's actually work out the math behind what we call the first principal component. Okay, what is the first principal component? It's the axis that when I project down onto it, retains the most variance in my data. Okay, why is it called the first one? Well, that's the first one, and then what's the second one? It's the axis after that that gives me the second most you know, variance uh, you know, that's orthogonal to the first principal component. So basically, I'm gonna try and build all these principal components on top of each other. How many? K of them, right? Because then I'm doing K different projections of my data into a K-dimensional representation. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that on the next slide, but first let's think about the first principal component. So remember we had something that looked like this, we were trying to project our data down onto this axis, right? And what I wanna do is I wanna find a projection That, max, uh, that maximizes my variance. How do I define this as a mathematical optimization problem? Well, it's actually not particularly complicated. Here I'm going to show you what that looks like, and then I'll explain some of the steps that I skipped in order to save room on this slide, uh, because you know we could get a little bit hairier, but a little bit you know, difficult given time and space constraints. So what I'm trying to do right, is, I'm gonna, is I'm trying to find a vector, w1, this is going to be like the vector that I project along, this green vector, right? I wanna find a vector w1, and since I'm just trying to find a direction, right, I'm trying to find a direction, the scale of w1 does not matter. Mathematically, things are actually gonna be easier if I restrict the scale of w1 to be one, okay? So I'm going to consider only unit vectors, right? So W1 needs to have one two norm, okay? And that's because I'm just looking for a direction. W1 just needs to tell me the direction along which I wanna pro project my data, okay? And what I wanna do is I want to have a W1 such that when I do the projections of all my data points onto W1, uh, those new data points have maximal variance, right? What does a projection look like? Well, remember, you know, let's actually, you know, write this out. So I have n data points, okay? So I'm gonna do a sum of all of those because that's how I calculate, or I'm gonna do an average out of all of those because that's how I'm gonna calculate variance. Let's actually think a little bit about uh, what goes into this sum. So what does a projection look like uh, between a data point xi uh, down to the vector w1? Well, it looks something like xi transpose w1 divided by the norm of w1, right? But that's one, so I can just not write that down, right? That makes things a little bit easier, right? Times w1, okay? So this here, okay, I'm gonna you know, manipulate this equation a little bit, but this here is what the projection of xi down onto w1 looks like, right? When I'm thinking about variance, right, I'm thinking about, you know, the sort of the magnitudes of all of these different vectors squared, right? Well, what is the magnitude of this vector? This has magnitude one, right, as I've specified. So it's actually just this thing over here, squared, right? So basically, I can get rid of the unit vector w1 and just consider the magnitude of all of those different projections. So I get this thing over here. So then this becomes the objective that I'm trying to optimize, right? I'm trying to maximize the variance of all the projected data 
which ends up looking like finding a W1 that's a unit vector that maximizes the average of you know, this quantity right here, which is, the which is you know, sort of the magnitude of all of the projected data points, okay, Xi transpose W1. This becomes sort of the equation or the optimization that I'm trying to solve in order to find my first principal component. We can actually write this in a, a sort of in vector, in matrix vector form, which is gonna make things a little bit easier. Uh, this is equal to, and again, if you know converting sums into matrix vector is confusing, it is confusing, uh, and sometimes you just got to get you know really really comfortable with sort of like pattern matching and finding all these things in order to be able to do these sort of very easily. Uh, but actually, this thing is actually just a two norm squared. This sum, or actually, yeah, this sum is a two norm squared between x and w1, where x is my design matrix, right? And I can equally write this in expanded form as W1 transpose X transpose X W1. So I can write my objective as argmax over W1 with the constraint that W1 has to be a unit vector of this thing over here. One over N, W1 transpose X transpose X W1. Why did I do this? Well, as it turns out, you know, one particular way that we can actually go about solving this problem or analyzing this problem uh, is by doing something kind of clever with X transpose X. Uh, so that's sort of where we're going to proceed from here. Okay, is everybody still with me, roughly? You'll also see a little bit of this in more detail in, in discussion. So if you're not quite grasping it, uh, at least the details, that's okay. Uh, but hopefully, you know, the high level bits you know, finding this W1 that maximizes the variance of the projected data. Everybody's still roughly with me. One other thing I can do, by the way, is drop this one over N. Oops, I didn't actually mean to erase that. I can drop this one over N uh, because it's got nothing to do with optimization, right? If I have a one over N versus not having that one over N, the W1 that I find in the end is gonna be the same. Okay, so because it's an argmax, I, I can forget about the one over N. Okay, so then what's the next step? Well, the next step is to be really clever, or you know, somebody at some point was really clever about this. So I said that we're gonna do something special with X transpose X. Well, X transpose X, let's think about it for a second, right? So X transpose X is square, right? It's symmetric. It's also positive semi-definite, right? What are some things that I can do with a matrix that's that special? Yeah, right, so I can do something like an eigen decomposition or a spectral decomposition, right, whatever it is that you want to call it. Those terms actually mean slightly different things, but it doesn't matter. So spectral decomposition. I'm going to take X transpose X and turn it into Q, D, Q transpose. What is Q? A mini quiz. Yes. Q is orthogonal. Yep, it's an orthogonal matrix. Mm -hmm. But what does Q contain? Yes. Eigenvectors, right? So the columns of Q are eigenvectors, right, of X transpose X. What is D? Yes all the eigenvalues, and what special structure does D have? Yes, diagonal, right? So all the off-diagonal entries are zero, and then all the diagonal entries uh, are these eigenvalues that correspond to each eigenvector, right? And oftentimes, uh, you know, the convention to make our lives easier is to sort these eigenvalues in you know, decreasing order if you're lucky, non-increasing order otherwise, right? So, you know, if you have, you know, some eigenvalues that are the same, you know, those can go in any order, uh, but generally it has to go decreasing on the way down. And then you properly sort the columns of Q as, as needed. Cool, so why am I doing this? Well, actually, what I'm gonna do is be 
really clever, and again, you know, not me, someone else, but what I can do is actually change my problem to make it easier to solve. I'm going to let z1 be equal to q w1. Basically, a, you know, changing my problem, a change of variables, if you like, okay? So I had this constraint, right, that w1 is a unit vector, so its norm is one. What is the norm of z1? What is the norm of z1? One. Why is it one? Because Q is orthogonal, right? So multiplying by an orthogonal matrix does not change the norm. Okay, that's a you know, good thing to know. What this means is that I can write my optimization problem in terms of Z. So I can write argmax of Z1 with the same constraint, Z1, the norm has to be one, okay? of, well, what did I have before? I had, you know, this thing, right, is W1 transpose QDQ transpose W1, right? So instead, I could write this as something like, oh wait, I think, you know, maybe I wanted, I think I wanted Q transpose here. That's okay too. Um, right, so if I write it in this way, then what I end up getting is Z1 transpose D Z1, okay? Because Z is like Q transpose W, right? D is a diagonal matrix, right? So this quadratic form is actually really easy to write out just in terms of the diagonal entries of D, because everything else is zero, right? So actually what this becomes is just something that looks like a sum, I'm gonna use uh, J to distinguish between the I I used earlier. Doesn't really matter what letter I use. I could use I again if I wanted. From J equals one to D, right? D where D is a number of features that I have, right? Of D I I, okay? So a diagonal entry along that matrix. J J, thank you. J, J, Z, J squared. Okay. Can anyone tell me just intuitively by sort of staring at the sum, how would I maximize it? What Z would maximize this sum here under the constraint that it has to be a unit vector? I see two hands, I randomly picked one. I think I saw you first. Fantastic, right? So let's make that even simpler, right? So assume like what I said before with convention that the, the largest eigenvalue is the first one, so it's D11, right? And then they just go down uh, as you move along the diagonal, right? The way that I'm going to maximize this, right, is by setting Z1 to one, and then all of the other uh, entries of Z to be zero, okay? I'm essentially placing all of my bets on the largest eigenvalue. That's how I actually end up maximizing this particular sum here, okay? If that's not coming to you immediately, uh, tr you know, try to think about, you know, sort of reason about, you know, what these terms DJJ and ZJ are and the constraints, uh, and then try to think about, you know, why it is the case that uh, you would want to put all of the, you know, mass that you can distribute on through Z onto the largest possible value, okay? But that is the answer. So ZJ, or sorry, so Z becomes essentially what we call a one hot vector. Okay, it's got one in one particular dimension and zero all others. And this particular way that it's organized, right, it's gonna be a one in the first dimension uh, because, you know, D, that's where D has the largest eigenvalue. So if Z is a one hot vector, well, actually, we've learned we've learned now what Z1 is, right? Oh, I didn't write one there, but everybody gets it, right? So we've learned what Z1 is, but that's, ex that's actually not the problem I care about, right? I care about what is W1, right? Well, that's actually pretty easy, right? Because Z is Q trans Z is Q transpose W, right? If I left multiplied by Q, 
right? Then I'll get Q, Q transpose, which is identity, W equals QZ, right? So after I find Z, I just multiply by Q in order to get W. And then what do I get? Well, since Z is a one hot vector, I'm actually just selecting the first column from Q, right? I select the first column from Q, and what is that? It's just the eigenvector that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue. That's all I get, okay? So W1, the first principal, com first principal component, turns out it's actually just the, lar the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of X transpose X, okay? All of this math that we did, and we found something. So that's our first principal component. I'll stop writing math because, you know, that's enough for one day. But let's uh, think about how we extend this idea to more dimensions. So to summarize the previous slide, the first principal component of X, W1, right, it's given by this particular optimization problem, right? Finding the projection such that when we project our data down, we retain the, as much variance as possible, right? And we saw that this W1 is actually just the eigenvector that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue of X transpose X. What if we want more than one dimension? What if we're not just doing dimensionality reduction on two-dimensional data into one-dimensional data? What if it's like a thousand-dimensional data and I want to reduce it down to a hundred dimensions, right? Well, if I want my second dimension, what I'm going to do is actually compute what I call the second principal component, okay? And then the first principal component and the second principal component together, I can do these separate projections into a 2D subspace that's spanned by these two principal components the sort of constraint that we put on the second principal component is that it has to be orthogonal to the first principal component, okay? Why? Because we're building this basis, essentially, that our new data is going to live in. This subspace is defined by this basis. It's a whole lot easier to make this basis orthogonal uh, in order to, you know, uh, you know ha not have to worry about anything like correlations between the dimensions and things like this. So actually, computing the second principal component, W2, has the same objective of finding the direction uh, such that when we project, we maximize variance, but it's further constrained to be orthogonal to W1 like we said before, right? So after we do W2, we can find W3. W3 has to be orthogonal to both W1 and W2, and so on and so forth in order to find you know, the top K principal components that we're looking for. As it turns out, W2 is actually super easy to solve for as well. W2 is just the eigenvector that corresponds to the second largest eigenvalue of X transpose X. So if I find Q, right, via like an eigen decomposition, I've actually found all the principal components that I care about. Okay, W1 is that first column, W2 is the second column, so on and so forth uh, of Q. And Q, by definition, is orthogonal, right? So, you know, having all these different principal components be orthogonal to each other already checks out in the way that we want it to. And like we said before, we can extend this idea to finding k principal components, which is sort of how you define the k-dimensional dimen k subspace that you're going to project the data down onto. W1, W2, all the way through WK forms that basis for our new reduced dimensionality data representation. So let's summarize principal component analysis. What is the best linear projection? One, de one definition that you could use that PCA takes is the one that retains the most information about the data in the form of variance. Okay, so after I project my data down, how much variance is left in the data, we want to maximize that in order to maximize the amount of information that we keep. We compute the D by K matrix, which is our projection, right, via this eigen decomposition of X transpose X, right? So Q, D, Q transpose. And then the matrix that we want is actually just the first k columns of q. So it's very, very easy after we compute this eigen decomposition. Thus, if I wanted to project my design matrix, right, my data x down into some k-dimensional subspace, I just write multiply by this uh, q1 through k, which I'm using to represent the first k columns of q, and then I get a reduced dimensionality data representation via PCA.
I have a slide about reconstruction, which we'll talk about next time. I just want to show you this uh, face example that I, uh, that I promised you. These are probably too small to see. But on the left, you have the original data. And then on the right, you actually have uh, sort of the data reconstructed via the first 100 principal components of this data. Okay, So you have 1,024 original dimensionality, 100 reduced dimensionality right, via PCA, uh, going down from 1,000 to 100 dimensions. And then you can actually you know, reconstruct the data from the 100 principal components that you have and uh, you know, use that to sort of get a visual understanding of how much information did you retain uh, via those first 100 principal components. You f it's, probably too f it's probably too small to see. But the faces are actually reconstructed quite well via these principal components, but not perfectly. So you lose a lot of the finer details about each image, but you retain a lot of the larger sort of like features and 